Was France's worst terror attack in recent memory a turning point? Two years on, commemorations to remember the 130 killed, along with the survivors of the shootings at the Bataclan Concert Hall, the National Stadium, and the, the terraces of uh, right bank cafes taking place this Monday. The new normal, two years on, includes beefed up anti-terror laws, the rout of jihadists on the battlefield in Iraq and Syria, Syria where the Paris attacks were commandeered. Now, ISIS may be on the run, but are we any better when it comes to counter-radicalization? After the commemorations, the French president in northern France this Monday to talk jobs and ways to strengthen the social fabric in working class places that, well, feel forgotten by Paris. But is that feeling of alienation uh, is sufficient? Does it, it only goes so far in explaining why a tiny but determined fringe would want to turn on the population of its own country in a year that's seen attacks most notably in Manchester, London, Barcelona, most recently New York. Are we any the wiser as to what to do? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the what we've learned two years after the Paris attacks. With us, Guillaume Denois de Saint-Marc, founder and president of the French Association for the Victims of Terrorism. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Uh, also joining us, human rights attorney Azif Arif, co-author of France-Belgium, The Terror Connection. Nice Thank to see you again. You. Thank you for having me. From Brussels, Ricardo Dugula, senior analyst at Risk Consultants Drum Cusack. Thank you for being with us. The France 24 Thank debate. Thank you for having me on Facebook and on Twitter, the hashtag F24Debate. Yeah, 130 killed, 90 of them at the Bataclan on November the 13th, 2015, this Monday ceremonies, including a hug between the President of the French Republic and Jesse Hughes, lead singer of the Eagles of Death Metal. He was on stage when the carnage began. No, my heart is here, and I love this place. And the French people have really made it possible for us to come back to life. So thank you very much. Thanks for being here, and thanks for all these young people. Well, I love this country very much. It's been good to me. See, we're here for you. Guillaume de Noël de Saint-Marc, you were on hand for, for that commemoration, which was then followed by a surprise concert by yeah. Jesse Hughes and his lead guitarist. Uh, two years. What are, what are the thoughts of the, the people that were there? We saw people crying in the audience. Yeah, it, it was a turning point. Um, the first anniversary was very difficult. Uh, this one was easier. Uh, uh, many of the victims went over at, uh, getting out of the victimized position. Uh, and getting back to, to life and uh, hum humanity. Um, but still, it's a process that takes time. Uh, it was much easier this year than it was last year. Um, many of the victims didn't want to come because it, they knew that it would be difficult. Uh, other ones would, would have come anyway, would have come anyway, and they came, uh, even if it was difficult. Um, it's the beginning, you know, it's a step forward to go on, to go to the, in the future. And, and it's necessary that uh, these steps forward, we have to be close to them. Because um, the, the social contract have been broken since the attack, and now we're trying to re rebuild this contract with them as a society, as, as also the, it's important that the president is there, because the target is the states and the society. So we need to rebuild confidence between the victims, the society, and the state. Let's just remind viewers of the timeline, because there'd been the attacks in January against mm -hmm. the satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo. Uh, there was that big demonstration, January mm -hmm. 11th of uh, 2015, uh, that hashtag, uh, Je suis Charlie, yeah. uh, which some didn't quite subscribe to, uh, most yeah. did, mm -hmm. um, and, and there was a debate about that. Mm -hmm. uh, in November, when it's people sitting on cafe terraces, that was different somehow. It was different because before, uh, the, the, the population thought uh, the target was the policemen, uh, were uh, the soldiers, were the Jews as a community, uh, were the journalists, and suddenly it could be anybody. And that was really a turning point uh, where everybody could, you know, everybody was trying to, to to they get away from tourism, they say, I'm not concerned. I'm not the target. 
But after the 13th of, uh, uh, of November, everybody, everybody could be a target. And it was shown also in Nice afterwards, uh, with, during the the fire, day with the Bastille Day attack, where you know, and kids were, were targeted. Everybody was targeted, not only a, a category or persons among the society. November 13th, two years ago, and it's still very much an active investigation. Helen Gainsford has more on that. On the 13th of November 2015, a series of unprecedented coordinated attacks took place across Paris. Salah Abdeslam is the only surviving suspect who took part in the events of that evening. He's the only one who was there at the scene of the attacks, the only one still alive who was there. That's why he's the key figure in the investigation. He organized the attacks, he played a bigger role than we first thought, and he was there when they took place. After four months on the run, Abdeslam was arrested in March 2016 in Brussels, then extradited to France a month later. Detained since then, he's refusing to cooperate with the French authorities. Altogether, investigators have succeeded in identifying 15 suspects connected to the attacks. Seven are detained in France, five in Belgium, one in Turkey. Two others are still at large. Authorities have uncovered the workings of the jihadist cell. Our investigation has revealed which of the suspects went to Syria, how they returned to Europe in the summer of 2015. We have detailed information on the logistics, the connections between these people, the jihadist cells and the hideouts. Authorities are now concentrating on finding all the financial backers of the attack and the network that enabled firearms to be transported to Paris. The investigation is expected to continue until 2019, while the trials of the suspects will take place after its completion. Ricardo Dugulin, uh, th that interview with the Paris prosecutor on Friday uh, serving as a stark reminder that, uh, well, we're still learning a lot about what happened. You remember at the outset, everybody said there was this uh, young man who'd hidden out in the bushes who was the branded the mastermind. Uh, he was killed a few days later in a shootout in the northern suburb of Paris. Turns out he wasn't the mastermind at all. Yeah, so what we see is that uh, the Paris attack in November were a transnational plot in which the militants who perpetrated them were acting from a command and control structure that was based in the Middle East. And uh, that was something that was specific to the terrorist threat in Europe at that point in time, when the Islamic State had the capacity to train and uh, dis the disperse militants from Syria and Iraq toward Western Europe. That is something that is changing now, that is changing because of the military defeats that the Islamic State has uh, suffered in the last few months mm -hmm. in Syria and Iraq. And uh, the terrorist threat now is evolving and be becoming very Europe-centric. So the Islamic State still has the intention of carrying out these attacks, maybe on a different scale, with using different tactics. But the point is that the, the cells, the militants planning those operations are now increasingly based in Western Europe, in France, in Belgium, in Germany, instead of being controlled from Syria and Iraq. Instead of being controlled from Syria and Iraq, uh, you, we saw in that report how they're tracking the financial backers. What are you expecting to find out from that? Well, the knowing the financials concerning an attack is especially important for uh, understanding all the line of command and all the line of, uh, of, of the structure of the operation. And this is going to be instrumental in seeing who was the final person uh, deciding on the targets and on, on, the, on the people being used, on the transportation means. That's extremely important to see the channels that had been used in the, in the November attacks. And, and when we look at more recent attacks in France and, uh, and Belgium and, uh, and, uh, and other places in Europe, the, 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 the financials and the structure of the, the, the command and control structure is smaller in the sense that the militants were recruited within the, the, the European countries instead of coming from abroad, so as foreign fighters from Syria and Iraq, and, uh, and, uh, and the financing lines are tighter. 
And so this is something that is important to understand the evolution of the Islamic State uh, strategy in regard to their uh, European campaign. I want to introduce at this point uh, another guest uh, from the United States, Varian Khan, editorial director at the Terrorism Research and Analysis Consortium, TRAC. Thank you for being with us here on, on France 24. We, we've just heard there uh, Ricardo Dugulin mention how uh, this operation masterminded from Syria, most uh, probably, uh, is something that, well, you won't see as much in the future because ISIS, of course, has lost that territory there. Uh, the nature of uh, these networks is evolving. It's becoming perhaps more localized. Uh, now, your job is essentially to monitor the chatter between jihadists. Is that something that you've witnessed? Um, yes, but the, I, I think that it's a little too uh, soon to say that uh, something like this wouldn't happen again. Uh, you must understand that even though they've lost a lot of territory in the Sham, they still operate very functional training camps in Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Libya, uh, Philippines. So, I mean, if any one of those particular smaller ones decide that they want to have trash transnational operations, they too can do exactly what Islamic State did from the sham. Uh, let me bring in Azif Arif on this. Uh, the uh, uh, operations that, uh, the Paris attacks, there was, of course, the subsidiary attack, which happened in Brussels when police were starting to close in on, uh, on the, uh, where the, a lot of the Paris attackers had been uh, hiding out in the Molenbeek district of, of the Belgian capital. We're now getting reports that they are perhaps plotting an attack on Amsterdam. Uh, at, your, your thoughts on the way that these networks have evolved since then? I mean, uh, the, the previous uh, intervenant uh, put, put, put this into perspective. The movement is becoming really European-centric. So um, my thought is actually... I. We cannot say where they're going to uh, attack or where they're going to move uh, uh, this time because you cannot track back where they are coming from. Even we have some... Uh, some thoughts that um, uh, Daesh is organizing it uh, or Daesh is losing some territory in, uh, in, in Iraq and in Syria. But uh, still, uh, the, the, the command is coming from somewhere. And unless we didn't localize this somewhere, we cannot say where this movement going to attack. So you agree that, that there is a top-down structure that's, uh, th this is, because at first, every time there's one of these attacks, first we're told it's lone wolf, and then it turns out, of course, no. No, I definitely think there was a, a, there, there was a commando who was attacking. There was an organized structure who was uh, perpetrating this attack. Of course, if you put in perspective with what happened with Charlie Hebdo or what happened with Mohamed Merah, this is where you can find this lone wolf or not lone wolf, even for Mohamed Merah who were thinking he's acting alone, but in fact, he has a couple of other person who was helping him. And I, I don't think, I, I think you have to wait a couple of years for the uh, investigation to go on in order to understand uh, what is the global structure. And of course, there is always a structure. There's always a structure. Yeah, uh, at least an ideological uh, structure, because uh, mm. uh, that's as, as, as a minimum. Uh, but every time we go on on investigation, there is more than that. Uh, there is all, all, all sort of person helping, uh, uh, pushing the person forward. Um, and we have a problem because, uh, and that's what we could see with the Mehra trial. Uh, that Mohamed the, Mehra, the 2012 Toulouse shooter. Yeah, uh, it's that the, the brother who was the ideologist, who was the person who, I would say, gave the weapon to the one who shooted, uh, cannot be uh, convinced for complicity. Uh, which for us is a problem because it's not a normal crime. It's a terrorist crime, and, it, and the ideology is part of the terrorist attack. Now, that, that verdict came in last week, yeah. and there was a jury of magistrates who said mm -hmm. the problem is there just wasn't the hard evidence. Is that the evidence is not about the, how there were uh, complicity between the two and how uh, the ideology was, sh was shared and how uh, one of the brothers gave all the the ideology for the second one to, to act. The problem is, does the, the, the ideologist knew that there would be a shooting on that day, on that target? This has not been proved. But of course, he has been convinced 
for association malfaiteurs, but that means he was Accessory. part of the group. Yeah, but we cannot really for the moment, but there, there is an appeal on so it. So for you, the, 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 this sentence, which was, he was sentenced to a heavy, heavy uh, prison the sentence. The heaviest he could... Thir 30 years, but he didn't get convicted of accessory to terror act. Uh, and you're, you're saying that it, it's the sentence is not hard enough. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that uh, if we want to fight terrorism, we also have to fight the ideologists. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a fight against uh, persons who have a vision of the world that is not compatible with ours. We have to fight against them uh, on everywhere. It can be uh, by speaking, by, by acting, but also every time that they bring persons to murder, they have to bring complicity because this ideology doesn't, is not compatible with all the normal uh, human beings. Ricardo Dugulin, uh, the uh, number of people yeah. who subscribe to this radical ideology would you say it's the same as it was two years ago? It's gone up, decreased? I think uh, the, the person who spoke before me made an excellent point, and, uh, and the number of persons who abide by these ideologies, so uh, the general the radical Islamist ideology proposed by ISIS, uh, is going. We see that the numbers uh, monitored by the police and inter internal intelligence services in France, in the UK, in Belgium, these numbers are growing. One, because the definition of a potential sp suspect has evolved over time. So this is one reason why these numbers are evolving. This includes, as well, people uh, responsible of online propaganda. So that's one reason why the volume is increasing. But as well, because uh, terrorist attacks, such as the November one in Paris, generate uh, a, a willing by some suspects, some militants, a small number of them, to emulate these kind of things. Mm. So we see that the, the, the risk generated by this portion of the population is quite high. And the problem is that the, this trend is likely to increase in the coming years. And, uh, and just a point on this is that we need to see that the core difference between ISIS and other terrorist groups that try to do the same things is that ISIS, the, the, core, the core strategy of ISIS is developing an ideology that is easily accessible and, and, and uh, very present on the cyber space. E easily accessible, and when, we, co and when we come back, we'll, we'll when, be, command and co when we come back, we'll be, we'll be talking about more about how to counter that ideology. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. With the 6.6% growth in 2016, the Republic of Guinea is taking off thanks to its mining resources, its hydraulic and agricultural potential, its youth and its tertiary sector. In order to present its national plan for social and economic development and over 50 projects for its inclusive and sustainable growth, Guinea welcomes all its partners to Paris on November 16th and 17th. What do you want from your news website? Fonsvancat.com Giving you easier access to information and faster for a unique experience. Fonsvancat.com The international news website. Welcome back. Before we resume the France 24 debate, some of the stories Laura Cellier is following for you in the newsroom. The death toll from that uh, earthquake near the Iran-Iraq border has topped 400 now. More than 6,000 injured. That toll expected to rise. Rescuers also having to contend with landslides. France's president to suggest to the UN Secretary General an initiative to defuse the tension in Lebanon. Uh, this, according to sources at the Elysee Palace that spoke to France 24, doubts persist over the freedom of movement for Prime Minister Saad Ariri, who on Sunday from Saudi Arabia promised his return to Lebanon was a matter of days. We are your ally. Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte sings the praises of Donald Trump, literally, 
Their Manila summit featuring none of the human rights lecturing of the U.S. president's predecessor, Barack Obama. Italy needs a win at the San Siro against Sweden if the Squadra Azzurra wants to avoid missing out on the World Cup for the first time in 60 years. Kedvon Gorgistani will have all the day's sports. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate on the second anniversary of uh, the Paris attacks, where 130 were killed. Uh, we're drawing lessons uh, with uh, Guillaume Denois de Saint-Marc, founder and president of the French Association for the Victims of Terrorism. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to human rights attorney Azif Arif. Uh, with us from Brussels, Ricardo Duculin, senior analyst at Rick Consultants Drum Cusack. And from the United States, Varian Khan, editorial director at the Terrorism Research and Analysis Consortium, TRAC. Uh, welcome back to all of you. Everyone knows someone in Paris, it seems, who was a victim on that unusually mild November night two years ago. At France 24, our thoughts go out to the family, friends, and work colleagues of sound engineer Mathieu Osh, who was on duty in this very studio for the world this week that Friday before attending that Eagles of Death metal concert, he didn't make it. For those who did, survival means a host of challenges. Yena Lee has more on that. Today, Benjamin can walk past the Bataclan without having a panic attack. I don't mind coming here. It doesn't make me feel anxious anymore. But the survivor of the November terror attacks has come a long way. Like many of the victims, he suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD can develop after experiencing a traumatic event. Symptoms include flashbacks, social anxiety, nausea and insomnia, a condition that can be more or less debilitating. Benjamin tells us about one of his panic attacks. I was waiting for the bus for a while when I saw a young woman wearing a niqab. The bus was coming closer, then I saw her dig around in her bag and adjust her veil. I was suddenly terrified, so I didn't get on the bus. I was somehow convinced it was going to blow up. Benjamin says he's better now, thanks to his friends and sessions with a psychotherapist. Antidepressants have also helped, but for others, these options are not enough. 30% of PTSD sufferers say antidepressants don't work, and 40% relapse within a year of starting the treatment, making doctors and patients look towards other ways to treat the disorder. Max has chosen to try a new form of therapy that could help him overcome his trauma. Witness of a deadly attack on a Parisian bar November 13th, he couldn't talk about the night without crying. When I tried this medicine, Je le vois. I see the event in front of my eyes, but I don't cry anymore. I'm more realistic. I can talk about it. They say I have to talk about it because it's good for me. 200 people in France are on the clinical trial, and the first results appear to be promising. But in order to be eligible for any kind of treatment, patients first have to be diagnosed. PTSD remains an underdiagnosed condition, and many sufferers do not receive the medical attention they need. Guillaume Dunois de Saint-Marc, uh, there's, there's obviously a whole separate debate. We won't go into it because we don't have the yeah, time about whether or not to medicate. But what, in your experience, and you've worked with victims of terror mm -hmm. attacks for over years, mm -hmm. what is the most effective way to overcome that trauma? Uh, what is very important is to get out from the victimized position. It means, uh, again, be a pilot, piloting your, your own life. It doesn't uh, happen immediately. You have to first come back uh, with, within the human beings because you don't feel that you're human anymore. And then you have to come back as a citizen to have your, uh, a normal uh, contact with your family, with your friends, with your work, with your environment, your friends and the civil society all together. And that goes step by step. Uh, and being able to, 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 to be a piloting your, your own life. It means new skills, because you're not a lawyer. You're not an expert in a, uh, 
uh, international uh, laws or international uh, events. You're not uh, an expert on religions. You, and you have to learn. You don't, you don't know anything about the media. Suddenly, you have to learn everything. So it's a new life. And you have to get the control of your, your new life step by step. It means medical assistance. It means uh, social assistance. It means compensations. Uh, it means recognition, because you're not the target as a victim. The, the target is the state and, and the society. So you have to be recognized by the society and by the states. And all this, step by step, can bring you back to pilot again your, your own life. And get out from your victimized position. You will, all your life, you'll be a victim. But you not look yourself or behave as a victim. All right. Don't consider yourself uh, a victim. Azif Arif, remember again, it was November 2015. It was months before the French presidential election. People said, oh, th with, after these attacks, the far right is sure to win the presidential election. I know it's not the one reason why. Uh, <laughs> there, were, there are many reasons why the far right didn't come to power. But I heard that a lot said at the time. I mean, uh, far right were also uh, playing on this uh, mm. uh, on this uh, on this rhetoric of uh, terrorist attack in order to gain some electoral uh, some electoral uh, core. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, French society has something very strange because a lot of my UK friends called me and they said, "Okay, Marine Le Pen will win," but I said, "We have two tours in the election, so we two have, rounds, uh, two rounds, so we have all the time to rethink about our." first choice. So basically what happened, uh, and I think, is French people needed at this time not a very uh, polarized talk, but more a decent and moderate talk. Mm. And even though we can, we say that we have, anytime we have debate and every time uh, something is happening with Muslim around France, we have a debate on that. I think debate is good for a healthy democracy. Mm. If we debate, it means we are talking. Mm. If we debate, it means we can evolve to some point. So I think what happened in the French election was uh, actually the resilience of French people against terrorism. And in some way, it was the French people who were talking to other. Of course, we can also see that there is a lot of people who didn't vote at this time. But still, we have to assess the fact that French people are really re re resilient. Sorry. After the most recent attack in New York City, Varian Khan, uh, the U.S. president talked about travel bans again. Uh, when you hear what you just heard from Azif Arif, what are your thoughts on uh, the jihadists? They, one of the things they want, obviously, is to polarize society. Mm -hmm. uh, do they succeed? Well, you know, the, one of the things is they're, they're constantly seeking some sort of harsh overreaction from the governing party in order to um, swing more support their way. <clears throat> this is what they perceive as a defensive jihad. They didn't do anything to, you know, they're just living out their normal lives and they're forced to jihad because they're defending themselves. That's the perception that they'd like everyone to think. And whenever they do a defensive jihad and the government harshly overreacts with, um, you know, what is perceived as, you know, overzealous countermeasures, it is their hope that they swing more support their way. And and what's been the how has it played out in your so, view yes, over the last two years? I guess they do polarize on some level. But I sorry. In, in that regard, how has it played out over the last two years? I, I missed it. How has it played out in terms of polarization in France and in um, the United States over the past years? it depends on the location. Years? In some places, rather well. In other places, not so well. Okay, so in France, I completely agree with the person who was speaking before. Um, it, it, I think they showed their resiliency by not you know, caving into complete fear-mongering. Um, in the United States, I don't want to put a judgment call. I think it also, you know, the United States is a very big place, and it very much depends on where you are. But New York City itself, I feel, shows the same kind of resolve mm -hmm. as France in the sense that they haven't let it completely um, uh, polarize their lives so that they can't see others' perspectives or have debate on the topic. So, Ricardo Dugulin, one of the lessons, you just heard it there from Varian Khan, is uh, 
Uh, don't overreact. That's what the jihadists want. Mm -hmm. Of course, civil libertarians here in France might say that uh, by putting on the books uh, some of the state of emergency measures, as was recently done, well, that is overreacting and that is playing in the hands of uh, the jihadists. What do you think of the changes in the French law that we've seen since the Paris attacks? I think the debate between uh, the equilibrium between security and civil liberties is going to remain the, one of the main debates concerning that question in the coming years. So that's a fact. The, the recent changes in, French, in the French law, in the French constitution, that's something that's going to help uh, security forces and internal, uh, internal security agencies to prevent terrorists from conducting similar attacks to the one in November 2015. That's one thing. So that's going to prevent, uh, help security forces mitigate the threat of complex and coordinated terrorist attacks. What these laws uh, are not fully doing yet is adapting to the new tactics used by the terrorists, so those that are more agile networks, more dynamic networks, and smaller cells. So that's something that we will see in the coming months and coming years to become more of the debate here in Europe on how to counter uh, propaganda on the web, how to counter propaganda and, and how do you do it? What, what's the way to, to do it? How to limit the recruitment on what? We... Well, there, there are some technical tools. So, for example, the, the, the disruption of websites, the disruptions of accounts. So that's something for terrorists not to be able to disseminate in, uh, information that may push others to do these things. So that's one thing. Cutting the IT tool. That's one aspect. The other aspect is to monitor the IT tool to gather the intelligence. And all of this can be quite controversial from a civil liberty point of view. Mm -hmm. And as well, all the human intelligence aspect of it that should never be diminished. So controlling the networks, because there is a, a link between militants and criminal networks. We see it in Belgium. We see it in France. So controlling those networks, seeing where the weapons are, seeing who talks to who, and putting all of this together to understand that, uh, as we were saying before, attacks are never lone attacks, single attacks, but they are linked to uh, different and more dynamic uh, cells. Azif Arif, monitoring where the money goes, monitoring where the weapons go, and as you just heard there, uh, Ricardo yeah. Dugula yeah. arguing for monitoring uh, as well, well, the chatter between these people. What are your thoughts as a human rights attorney? Well, I think on the on the last uh, law who passed in into our common law, le, 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 if, if we can say that, I'm not totally agreeing because the debate on civic liberties or security, we should have it. Uh, because uh, even though we adopted this law, when uh, terrorism will not stop, I mean, you mentioned before that the ideology has spread. And when the ideology has spread, we are not uh, safe from any other attack at any time. But when another attack will happen, what will be the next law? What will be the next civil liberties that you're going to take from your citizen in order to counter terrorism? And that's the big issue that we have here. And the second point is the legislation who has been incorporated in our law now is based on suspicion. And that's a very huge point in terms of civic liberties. We changed the term of accusation where we have proof and elements, solid elements, in order to invict some, some, somebody to suspicion. If you are a friend of, of or if you are uh, dealing with, or whatever general term that we can have, you can go under this law. So I think we should uh, discuss this uh, a part of civic liberties that we are giving, actually, to uh, terrorists, because we don't have any... Uh, if I am uh, concerned by uh, this civic, uh, the, the civic liberties uh, challenge, a lot of millions of people who are concerned by this. So why are we going to leave this leverage to uh, the act of terrorists? Very Khan. May I interrupt? Sure. Um, one thing that you, one thing that we're not very good at right now is that Islamic State 
it spans across all messaging. I mean, we're not just talking Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. Literally any site I can go to, I can find some sort of Islamic State supporter or some sort of Islamic State messaging in it. think it's a mistake to try to close the door. It's like putting something in a closet, locking it, and say, whatever you do, don't look behind that door. Don't look behind that door, because it makes the door more alluring, opening up the door. What's behind it? What could possibly be there? Instead, you teach it as a historical evidence of some wrong perception. And the mistake that we've had is we think there's some magic bullet, that there's some message that will, across the board, just wipe out, you know, three years of constant messaging across multiple platforms with lots of different messages, because they don't necessarily know what's going to appeal to somebody, whether that's a beheading or whether that's an ideal at caliphate where you can raise your children um, in some sort of, you know, heaven environment. Any which way, we have to have that many messages to counteract what they say and be less worried about taking and removing every single piece down, because I don't think that's possible. Soviet-era Russia, with very little civil, civil liberties, was not able to prevent that. Yeah, we were able, uh, we're at least able to be on our guard, very uncon, when it comes to things like pedophilia on the web. Uh, but when it comes to uh, messages that are calling for the killing of innocents uh, on the internet, there's the civil liberties aspect that Azif Arif was talking about. How do you put put forward, though, the sort of the alternative message, what they call the counter narrative to that for people who might be vulnerable and prone to subscribe to a radical ideology? Well, first of all, it can't come from just one place. It can't just be a, a public service announcement on television. It has to be coming from all kinds of messages in all kinds of locations. One of the things that we don't have on our side is that somebody who might be tending towards a more radical idea is actively seeking other people to give them advice on that radical idea. We don't have people on the fence saying, talk me out of it. So we have to make the identifications, and then we also have to have the correct messaging across every type of media there is. I'm talking print, visual, audio, um, magazines, newspapers. We have to have a propaganda machine as big as theirs with a lot of different messages to know what would appeal to different types of people. Guillaume Denois de Saint-Marc? Yeah, I agree on that. But um, I think one of the things that we have to do is much more debate with the person that could be radicalized. Exactly. It's very important just to speak together. And, and I think not on a global, but as, as humans and on a personal uh, story. And that's what we do as victims, where we, 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 we meet with a pe person that could be uh, on the trap to get r radicalized. And we, sp we speak about the victimized position and how uh, victims of terrorism who, who are victims. Nobody can doubt about that. And with your association, you do that. You go. Yeah, to, you we go, go in prisons. We go in in, di in different places. Everywhere we meet every, anybody, you know. Uh, and we we speak how we we show not how we were victimized because this is obvious, but how we went out from our victimized position, how we rebuilt the link with the society, how we yeah. thought about everything, how complicated it was, how life is complicated. And how you, we came back from this victimized position to be a citizen again. And this opened the eyes to many persons who see themselves as victims and un, un, uh, understood. Guillaume, you know we're in France here. And yeah. you, you heard their very uncon saying it can't be a public service message decreed by the government. We love things that come from the state, from the top in mm. France. So how do you make it that sort of grassroots kind of momentum that you're describing? Uh, in Italy and in Spain, uh, for example, there is uh, in, during the scolarity there is a, 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 a day where people are meeting victims of terrorism, yeah. which is just a way to speak about the problem, speaking about radicalization, speaking about what is it to be a victim, how do you get out from a victimized position, what is what is society, what uh, how as an individual do you get out of the society and come back into the society, how how difficult it is sometimes to, to just to be a citizen. And this debate uh, done by a human being to, to other human beings, individual story, not the big story, our individual stories. And we do it with three or four victims of terrorism from different backgrounds, di victimized from different terrorist attacks, coming from different countries with different religions. And all the debate with the audience 
is the most important thing of the, we tell our stories and then there is a debate. And this is a way to s show how life is complicated. And so you can be a victim, but you can also choose to go into vengeance and anger or to rebuild yourself and to re rebuild the link with the society. And that's your personal choice. All right, it's not black and white. Guillaume it's not du black and white. Guillaume Dunois de Saint-Marc, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Azif Arif. I want to thank Varian Khan oh. for being with us uh, from the United States and uh, Ricardo Dugulin for being with us from uh, Brussels. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to uh, Emma James. Uh, Emma, the one place where perhaps things are a little bit black and white sometimes is social media. And that you've been experiencing today, looking at some of the fallout from... Uh... Yes, very much so. Um, it's been interesting to see. Um, I think there is a marked difference between how this anniversary has been um, responded to online uh, compared with how it was last year. Um, and some people have done the very predictable things, tweeting the images like this, which include all of the 130 victims uh, from that night two years ago. And, and that its sort of thing is being shared very widely, uh, as are images like this one. Um, this from shortly after the 13th of November 2015. That's the foot of the uh, big statue in Republique, yeah. uh, Place de la Republique. Même pas peur, uh, not at all afraid. Don't um, forget. It, it kind of became the uh, that motto uh, of, of the moment. People were, were saying it like a mantra, Mem papa, I'm not afraid, France is still standing. Um, and it was something really the, that I think people used almost to paper over the cracks in, in how they were feeling. Um, elsewhere, we've got uh, very moving messages from uh, Georges Salinas, uh, one of the fathers uh, of a victim uh, who died at the Bataclan, his daughter Lola, just 28 years old. Um, he's tweeted a great deal uh, today marking this, saying that uh, it will never be a day like the others. He says, I don't know if the Republic will always commemorate these attacks in 10, 20 or 30 years, um, but he knows that for him and for everybody else uh, and so many other people um, that it will not be the same day as, just as a, others. Just a technical question on this. Yes. N now Twitter has the 280 character rule. In a case it's like this one where, you know, this is the father of a victim getting his thoughts across. Is it a good thing then? Yes, absolutely. I mean, he has more uh, means than most for getting his message across. He's also written an article for the Huffington Post, um, or actually I think they called him after they saw his tweets. Um, and in that, he goes into a little bit more detail about the fact that he has found this second anniversary so much harder than he did the first, because after one year, they were still very much in the thick of things, whereas this time around, they had started to get their life moving mm. in a sense of normality. Um, but this anniversary has just plunged them back into memories and mourning, he says. Um, now, I saw this tweet first thing this morning, and this is a similar theme, but put much more simply really hate this date and a broken heart and, and 13th of November. I think a lot of people felt like that this morning when they, they first got up and certainly a lot of people commenting on it on social media. Um, for the French president as well, today was a fresh test for him because this is a moment when he has to be the statesman, but he also needs to be very, very sensitive because of the situation and the kind of people that he's encountering. Now, he did actually get pretty emotional, it has to be said, especially when meeting victims. Uh, he posted this video himself, lots of people talking about the fact that he was very much on the verge of tears, Brigitte Macron as well, looking very emotional. Um, but that hasn't been greeted across the board um, in a positive fashion. Um, as you can see, it, very genuinely there, you can see that he is full of emotion at this moment. But this person, among those using the phrase at de crocodile, at crocodile tears, uh, simply believing that this is just uh, a political trick that he's employing. Uh, this Twitter user as well saying, um, cry a few tears and hope that it gets you a few uh, points higher in the popularity opinion polls. This is from an alt, guy well, who calls himself alt-right. Absolutely. Alt -right. Yeah. A, a lot of these tweets yeah. are undoubtedly politically motivated, you have to say. Um, and not everybody is, is saying the same thing. But I was surprised there weren't more positive comments uh, out there on social media. Um, this Twitter user, though, is slightly trying to redress the balance, um, saying that he's the president and he's human. And uh, he basically said, having read some of the commentaries, uh, comments on Twitter, um, that he actually feels sorry for people. Hmm. And the, the, the politics uh, are just part of it, right? 
Very much so, because of course there are many people who are angry for other reasons. Um, perhaps politics comes into it, it's kind of unavoidable really. Um, but Michael Diaz, who is the son of uh, Manuel Diaz, who was the first person to be killed on that night, the 13th of November 2015, uh, at the Stade de France, he refused to shake the hand of uh, President, President Macron. Um, and he has talked mm -hmm. before about being unhappy with the way things are handled. Again, he's written an article uh, in the Huffington Post explaining explaining his reasoning. He feels that the Macron administration has treated the victims of terror in a way that is contemptuous and unacceptable. Um, he said that while the terror attacks continue, the victims' voices are heard less and less often. Uh, and that in particular, of course, they're talking about the fact that this Minister for Victims Assistance uh, was actually got rid of by Emmanuel Macron, Juliette Midel, and they feel that they have no spokesperson now in government. Guillaume de de Saint-Marc, of course, people project their own pain sometimes on this issue. Yeah, uh, it's normal. They are, it, uh, it's really painful for them. And of course, there was a bad signal at the time because of the new government and there was this secretary d'etat that did not go on. But it has been replaced by something much more efficient, which is a, a, a delegation interministérielle de l'aide aux victimes, which is very, very active. And we, we work with, with them and it's much even more uh, active than it was before. So it's, it's not a good debate, in fact. But anyway, we can understand the feeling of the, of the victim because there was a big change and that it, nobody explained them how we would go from, right. from point A to point B. So there was a lack of education. And, and certainly course, reading the remarks, it does look as though um, victims' families just feel that they don't know who directly to go to, yeah. whereas they did before, and that, that's all part of that change. Mm. All right, we're going to leave it there for now. I want to thank you, Emma James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.